growing and seeing some of these trees uh, become bigger forests to me like goes back to showcase how it's important for us as a society to intentionally do whatever things we do. Um, uh, a grandfather trying to uh, you know carry or tag along the grandson to a tree planting mission might seem as a simple thing, but to me, it was an important step that helped me to number one, just get dirty uh, as a normal kid would get, but then later on to realize that actually you are part of a bigger goal, a bigger plan and, and helping you to understand um, the nature around you. But going back to it, um, through Kenya Environmental Action Network, obviously we started this around um, at the height of the pandemic uh, in 2020. And the whole idea was to sort of create a national network that will bring together um, Kenyan environmental and climate um, advocates uh, with a sole mission to actually connect to the movement together to support each other's action, but also see how we can overcome the um, common challenges that usually environmental and climate groups face from any part of the world, some of them including financing, um, capacity building, and, and the bit of you know, uh, lack of lack of knowledge. So through the network, we sought to exactly bring together um, uh, environmental and climate leaders to extend the knowledge and learn from each other's struggles, wins, and experiences. So yes, on we've been able to do impactful projects in Kenya, and and the one single one that I want to mention is the Africa Youth Caravan COP27. And I said this noting that um, we we recognize um, the critical placement of Africa is the world's uh, youngest population. And what I always tell people is that this is a demographic that you can never assume or avoid. And that if you have to plan for uh, environmental conservation, then you do have to factor in the critical part or role of uh, youth. And in this case, Africa needs to be part of the solutions uh, on restoration, conservation, and new livelihoods that um, young people are creating uh, at the grassroots. So through the Africa Youth Caravan to COP27, we were able to sort of like engage in a decentralized uh, a caravan that build up on the power of uh, sub-regional workshops and work connecting youth across the initiatives that are doing in the regions from Southern Africa to Eastern Africa to Western Africa, Northern Africa. And this happened um, throughout um, from mid 2022 to the time we went to Egypt, um, just around the end of October. And our key messages were actually on just energy transition, youth action and resilience, that we understand the critical role of uh, our ecosystems in Africa, the ecosystems that are the backbone of our agriculture, the ecosystem that provide water and, and other resources to our communities. And that when the story of Africa is being told, we need to show the positivity that communities are trying to push forward and we need to center these communities to be able to therefore lead um, in, in the journey of restoration and conservation of our natural resources. So yes, you are able to take a total of 20 African youth to COP. And for me, I think it was a great experience. It's, it's my third COP to attend and, and seeing the power of connections and, and trying to leverage and hold each other's hands as African youth for me was a phenomenal experience. Um, and then, uh, you know, occupying the corridors of power uh, negotiations and of course with people like Gratna, um, meeting some of our peers at the conference itself was very important. But I think what stood out for me amidst the negotiations and what has been um, like named as one of the successes is loss and damage fund being, um, uh, a key outcome of the of the of the conference. To me, I think that, that the decision and the action was not happening in those bilaterals. I think the main decision was happening in the side events, in the pavilions, and every particular activity that was happening uh, through civil society, the indigenous groups, and and farmers groups, and most of the otherwise called grassroots um, and on the ground people that are pushing for change and helping communities to adopt uh, adapt to. Uh, the climate crisis and also build resilience around the, around the same. So I think I'll just quickly wind up by saying how we can meaningfully engage a youth, and in this case, African youth in conservation and, and protection of our natural resources is number one, understanding where youth are coming from. Young people right now, I think of the advantage of going through modern science and education. And so we do have relevant knowledge to be able to um, lead on conservation 
but at times it becomes hard to even start a career in conservation or engage with um, other folks because it's a bit restrictive or you have to have certain qualifications for you to be able to you know sort of like fit into the system but i think the youth the world's youth of today are t telling us otherwise we don't need to do business as usual we need to challenge the status quo and we need to um push for new ways of uh, even the work environment and engaging in investments around nature around communities and around the workplace so i do think that that bit of understanding young uh, people and and where, where we are coming from what we are bringing uh, I, I know we do have um, the benefit of time, energy, creativity, and innovation. And to me, that is what is needed um, in terms of robotics, um, uh, GIS, and more new innovations that are to help uh, create more interventions for nature, against nature laws, and of course, for biodiversity conservation. I do think young people also present opportunity to decentralize power through financial mechanisms. Um, and what I, I tell people that we are not necessarily expensive. We are not an expensive demographic to work with. Young people don't need trillions of dollars to actually work and engage in conservation or climate action. We just need the bare minimum. We need funds enough to unlock our potentials and to help start up um, our initiatives and sort of like give that bit of foundation so that we can move to the next level. So seeing the potential in fund funding youth-led initiatives and community-led initiatives of course, in, in incorporating youth people, I think young people, I think that will be an important one, uh, even as we discuss um, the future of conservation and protection of our ecosystems. And, and through such initiatives like um, CEC and another um, young professionals network, I think that then becomes a critical space for us to meet our peers, to extend, extend the knowledge, but also share opportunities because at times, I think people don't get access to these things because uh, they are not connected to people from other disciplines or other parts of the world. So such professional networks would really help Africa's youth and, and the world's youth in protected and conservation areas to access and lead on uh, more conservation efforts at the grassroots. And finally, I will say um, the bits of a storytelling. I believe the human speech is a uh, species uh, born and uh, sustained through storytelling. Our cultures has taught us the power of telling stories and passing it down history and the memory lens. So if we can also recognize the critical role of um, storytelling, art and culture in our communities, our indigenous knowledge and how we can package it to pass it down to the uh, younger generation, that that becomes a big investment uh, even for those of us who are leading or interventions um, against nature laws and biodiversity laws. And therefore, uh, if all these are things that we can consider in our discourse, then I believe the future of conservation and protection of our natural world and ecosystems would be assured and it will be assured because we've empowered the youth demographic uh, component of our society and we've have created new opportunities for them to uh, leverage on the potential that we bring to the table. Uh, thank you so much. And I wish to hand it off uh, back to Diana. Thank you so much, Kaluki. It's an incredible journey that you had, and thank you for sharing your personal story as well. I am sure we will have some more time in the end. I am personally thrilled to hear more about the caravan experience. I trust it's a big deal to pull it, but also an experience for those who participated to really be there in a meaningful, sustainable way and interacting so much. I imagine young people learning, feeding into each other's experiences was quite an incredible journey. Thank you once again for, um, for being here and sharing this and um, looking forward to the Q&A at the end to get back to this more. It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Nishad Shafi. Um, Nishad is an environmentalist, a policy-oriented so -oriented social change advocate, best known for his work on youth climate movement, environmental and climate policies in the Middle East. An active civil society um, member and has been a prominent presence at the International Climate Summits, especially UN Climate Summits, COPS, since 2015 on various capacities, including role of youth and civil societies for climate action. Uh, he holds a master's degree in environmental engineering and is based in Doha, Qatar. Nishad was named in the apoliticals list of the 100 most influential people in climate policy in 2019 and 22, respectively. 
Um, Nishad is currently the co-founder and executive director at the Arab Youth Climate Movement on the um, Arab uh, Youth Climate Movement Qatar. And uh, his incredible experience on the ground, uh, leading the organization to be first youth-led um, registered NGO in Qatar Doha, um, making the organization also um, not only recognized and known on the national level, but with international outreach, makes me really pose a question to Nishad related to this whole experience of bringing the work from on the ground level further to establishing a youth leader, uh, youth led organization that has international outreach. How was this experience? How is the state of youth movement in MENA region? Um, the floor is yours, Nishad. Happy to learn and hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Kaluki. Interesting to hear your, your great uh, caravan experience, too. I hope to hear more in the next uh, questions, maybe. And thank you, IUCN team, also for the invitation to be here uh, fresh but exhausted after the COP27. It's great to give them a, a uptake of what they have been doing. Also the fact these COPs are happening in the main region, which is Middle East and North Africa. And again, coming back to Dubai in the UAE next year, close to the neighbor country. So a lot of at stake for the regional youth, especially how we are performing, what is at stake for the young people from the region. So Diana, thank you for bringing up uh, some, some good uh, memories from the past, where we have been and where we are today. So, my experience starts when I graduated in 2015, and um, we, there was a lack of uh, youth movement in the region. And that is when we started Arab Youth Climate Movement as a very small uh, um, university -led, student led organization, which went on to become an association in 2018 uh, as a non profit uh, environmental association, which is uh, independent and the only one in the state of Qatar, which is independent and working within the youth community from a very grassroots level. So uh, our story becomes very humble and we try to uh, persuade more young people to join our organization and pursuing them to get on board uh, in our discussion around climate and environment, given the fact uh, Qatar hosted the COP18 back in 2012. Many of the young people back then don't even realize the importance of climate. It was in that hippie back then. So it was in the big youth movement. There was no even youth led organization even attending. Unlike the negotiation group who are still following, who I again met at uh, Sharm El Sheikh, were the same people who are deeply involved, not just sitting in the youth pavilion, but we're not following the negotiation, fighting the, uh, you know, their governments uh, and bringing the corporates accountable. So there's a big shift in how the whole youth movement also shifted from what I have seen to what I am today. I see um, um, my mere talking uh, rather than uh, more action on the ground has not been seen anymore. And like in the past, people used to follow cops from a very, very, uh, they follow word to word, like how the negotiation does. But nowadays now, I don't even how many even read the, um, uh, any of the documents which has came out other than the news. So there's a big shift how we used to follow negotiation to what it is today. Uh, it was a uh, deep knowledge building for us. We used to run capacity building training for our young people before we attend COPS because it's a lot to consume. Uh, so we prepare ourselves that we divide the team to somebody to follow finance, somebody to follow adaptation, mitigation. We used to follow on Article 6 back then, et cetera, et cetera. It, it was a huge task within the organization to do that but unlike now you know people are just um, more on advocacy and you just see them on a couple of panels and that's it uh, end of the story they come back from cop so i think in terms of our youth from the region is also following the global trend nothing much change we also are happy to attend the cops and come back home uh, what is missing is a larger context of what's happening. What is that implication to youth organization? How youth organization can play a huge role? You might have seen in the new um, Sharma Sheikh uh, agreement, uh, do touch base on the youth role and why we need young negotiators in the national uh, teams. We're all focused, but uh, which young people from our uh, advocacy group can be joining those groups? All the government will say no to all of them because their knowledge base is zero. So we have to build that sort of creative, well-informed, young breed of brand of young people who are really following the negotiation from a very close, uh, um, uh, you know, from close angle, understand the technologies, who understand the each praxis 
which are put at the negotiations. I don't know how many even know what are the brasses means in the negotiation text. So these are things which are missing here also. So our advocacy group started basically like on the conservation. We used to take our young people to our mangroves here in Qatar. That was the first sort of an outdoor activity we used to do. And we have a very pristine mangroves here, one of the rarest in the region. So. We also did a sort of uh, conservation activities with the ministries where we were uh, planting uh, mangroves around the existing mangroves. It's a well-protected region, actually. So that, that was also a humbling start for us to build that sort of uh, understanding and bringing them back to the nature. And moving on, we wanted to build a sort of a strong advocacy plus policy. So we focused on young people, not only doing advocacy programs for youth in schools and universities. We targeted uh, uh, governments and diplomats to understand more on the uh, understanding of what is country stand, what they are and where they're working at a different level, at the country level, what Qatar needs, at the regional level, at GCC, which is a Gulf uh, Governing Council, and at the very broader regional Saudi stand as an Arab, uh, Arab leader at the COPS. So we, we have to, you know, cut short uh, to different levels of understanding what is at stake at the COPS. So it, it's been a quite an enormous journey to understand that. And uh, given the context, the changing scenarios uh, with the uh, oil and gas industries, with government, which has the most, um, most or basic economic uh, uh, activity in this part of the world, it is quite interesting to see the negotiation changing shift from uh, or from Paris, at least from the Paris, which I started to show and shake. Um, what is evident is that there is a quite a change in how most of the industry sees um, a climate change to what it used to be in the past. So I think uh, uh, given the fact more young people are stepping into uh, to negotiation roles, you can see from Tunisia to Saudi Arabia, a lot of young people on the team, which brings up those changes from the very, you know, the, from the older generation who used to feel that uh, climate action means moving away, um, um, uh, you know, taking away your fossil fuel industries means no more economic growth. But unlikely, the new young breed of people feels that there is a there is a much larger interest in developing our um, our um, infrastructure around renewable energy, uh, infrastructure on sustainability, infrastructure in all countries. Um, non-oil sector in like manufacturing industries etc uh, that has been quite a shift of mind from the older generation to new and i find a lot of intergenerational uh, dialogue happening in within this part of the world is quite a promising thing uh, but i i also uh, also evident that young people's advocacy is very key uh, they not only need to be an advocate but come up with uh, creative solutions through their education and because young, young people in most of our part of the world are highly educated they really need to use their background in bringing up great solutions to climate action of course advocacy should follow hand in hand but the real real action happens in this part of the world is that when you really talk to the negotiators and the country focal point or the or the government officials the first question is that uh, what are your solutions you propose i mean you cannot just uh, blab around like uh, what do you need climate justice now what is actually justice means for many of the community members how do you define that from our regional context most of the time, all these terminologies are very global north. I mean, I've been uh, seeing that for some time. Most of the conversation about climate and conservation are very global north, uh, which doesn't uh, touch base to our region, which is part of the West Asia, which is Middle East, um, are far quite not even touching our livelihoods. So people really don't understand what does that mean to them in their own context. So defining those to the regional context and getting that is the role of an you know, organization like ours to do that, how to bridge that um, larger conversation from a global to be bringing to your local context is something that we've been also fighting for or also we're trying to build on. Over the years, we try to bridge that, you know, uh, breaking those uh, international conversation to a local one, how that has to do with community to our respective governments, etc. We've been 50% uh, successful. I think it's not an easy path to follow, but we've been doing quite well in terms of our, uh, our achievements over the last two years. And uh, more and more young people are enthusiastic to join our organization and the movement. We believe we have been creating a, a, a new breed of young people who are more advocate, more policy oriented, and who are looking for real change on the ground. And we're happy that our programs are also doing quite well. We've been working with uh, UNESCO, we're working with national governments, regional governments, and other NGOs in the region in, in bringing more projects regionally. We've also been supported by um, um, other national organizations and embassies who have been supporting in uh, getting funding. Funding has been always a key issue for many of the youth organizations in the MENA region. Uh, we also had some funding coming during the COP in the region, and I hope it uh, 
uh, it do come in the years um, since uh, the COP is also coming back again next year in UAE. So quite a bit of time for young people to rethink how they want to work on the climate issues within the MENA region, especially on conservation issues uh, in some of the countries like in Jordan, Lebanon. It is quite important given the fact that they have a large ecosystem unlike ours, which is more desert ecosystem. Uh, so I think uh, more and more youth has to move into conservation. Uh, people think um, conservation is more on a, a farmer's job. They don't really understand that more and more people are uh, coming back from agriculture background more on agroeconomy, biotechnologies, uh, all has to do uh, around conservation of environment, which is not exactly going to the field, but also off the field and on the field and putting those policies to make sure that they are conserved. So I think larger um, um, capacity building of young people on this contest is necessary in our part of the world. And uh, this would be ideally done through collaboration and partnership. And I look forward how this sort of um, uh, this can be bridged so that we can help more and more young people from the Middle East joining in conservation activities uh, within the coming years. Probably I'll stop there. Diana, thank you so much. Thank you, Nishad, for this profound recap on the state of youth movement in MENA region and your reflections on COP and the role of young people in such high level events, but also in contributing to nature conservation work in wider terms. There is indeed a um, great way in which young people can participate, but is already um, being involved. And the importance of engagement of young people cannot be underlooked. The discussion we're having today within the dialogue um, is a way to really highlight again the importance of having meaningful engagement of young people. Happy to hear from you on your perspective and also willing to hear more in the Q&A and for the discussions in the session. I know you've got great experience within the region, but also internationally and uh, the perspective and um, experience of hearing from peers, really representing many other international youth organizations in climate movement. With this, I'd like to move on to the next presenter, our guest, um, Yugratna Srivastava. Yugratna is a 26-year-old from a middle-class family in India. Her several years of advocacy and policy experience on environment and development nexus have allowed her to have um, a vocal advocate role of meaningful youth engagement. She has held elected leadership roles in multiple youth networks. Currently, she serves as the elected environment policy officer for the major group of children and youth. By profession, she is a student and works part-time for Ecological Organization Fund for the uh, Planet International. In the run-up of the Paris Agreement work program, she served in the negotiation team as one of the young diplomats, where she supported work of G77 and Oasis Nations. She has previously served as Global South Focal Point of UNGO, Youth con Constituency of UNF C in 2018, and had led processes of establishment of several youth engagement mechanisms in UN systems, such as UNCCD Youth Caucus, SDG7 Youth Constituency, Chemicals and Waste Youth Platform, and very recently, the Youth Task Force on UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. In 2020, Yugratna was also nominated by the UN Secretary General as one of the champions network of the UN Food System Summit. Her early background in environmental space lies in grassroots organizing, including with networks such as 350.org, um, advocacy on divestment from fossil fuels, and door-to-door -door campaigning during school days. Having addressed the UNGA and delivered three TEDx talks until date, she has also been conferred awards such as the Arbor Day Award, accorded to the Plan for the Planet recognition under the Betty Bachao, Betty Patel by Government of India on Environment of Girl Child. I have had a pleasure of meeting Yugratna through the work in Stockholm Plus 50 um, Youth Task Force and in so many other youth works and networks and the experience within youth constituencies under UN umbrella and outside of it made me really um, 
refer to Ugratna's extensive experience and ask to reflect on um, the role of youth in climate conservation, current challenges, and also uh, the progress made by date. Yagratna, the floor is yours. I'd be happiest to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, Diana, and thank you so much also for having me uh, here. Um, please, have, I apologize for my, my voice. I'm recovering from a really bad uh, COVID after, after COP. And uh, um, so I'm trying to maybe speak a little bit slow <laughs> than my regular pace. And uh, I'll share my screen quickly before we uh, jump into some of the uh, some of the discussions. So, um, you know, Diana, uh, the, uh, you asked uh, uh, the two guiding questions allocated to me were about how are young people engaged in environmental processes at the UN and what is coming up for the next uh, two years. And that is absolutely central and essential um, that I think uh, at a starting point, I would say that all the members of CDC and beyond that are in this in this call to recognize that the next two years that we are looking at both 2023 and 2024 um, are going to be central towards how the multilateralism itself is saved um, or shaped. Uh, we are looking at something as big as Rio plus 20 or Rio 1992 itself heading into 2024. And this is something we have been trying to build more and more youth engagement um, uh, towards. So just to highlight, first of all, when you look at environmental dimension, um, it is central to the work of the UN itself. Um, it was in 1969, uh, those of you know that know the history, um, that there was a report in the UN which sort of prioritized environmental processes at the heart of it. And in 1972, um, the Stockholm conference itself happened. And this year we had the Stockholm uh, plus 50 that took place in Stockholm again. Um, so it was one of the topics that UN addressed. And since 2015, so what happened in 2015, is that the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development was adopted and the High Level Political Forum was established. So uh, the what happened essentially is that it became a system-wide priority for the UN. Before, sustainable development was often seen or only seen as part of uh, what is called as Commission on Sustainable Development, but then it became a system-wide priority on the same level as peace and security, human rights, and humanitarian assistance which are the core of which have been historically the core of the functions of the UN. Obviously, as you know, that currently environmental issues, especially climate change topics are very high on the political agenda, but it's important to highlight that climate change cops are not going to solve the triple planetary crisis. We have to give equal, and if not, uh, I would even say the term equitable attention across all the environmental processes and beyond, making sure young people are engaged even in lesser known conventions and MEAs, whether that's um, the Convention on Migratory Species, whether those are discussions on chemicals, whether those are discussions on topics which are not that much um, on a day-to-day -day agenda and of, of uh, people. And also it's central to realize that a lot of attention on climate change is also because of what the fossil fuel companies have been doing in order to build that narrative. So what I wanted to um, highlight is that system-wide effort is, is needed and we need to engage across um, the different MEAs. And to give you a short uh, overview, this is a copy of a diagram from UNITAR from their um, capacity building platform, which uh, talks about um, essentially what are the different MEAs in the UN system, right from 1970s to 2000. And very soon, hopefully you can add here a plastics treaty, which is currently going to be negotiated uh, later this month and negotiations are going to start. And so this is quite important to understand that um, across all of these topics, whether that's wetlands, whether that's um, you know migratory species, whether that's uh, preservation of the ozone layer. And of course the Climate Change Convention stands right here in 1992. It is important that young people are engaged. Um, and the essence for this is that problems affect everybody. Um, and a lot of problems that we face are interlinked to uh, what is happening on global agenda. Um, I think Diana mentioned some of this in, in the intro, but we do have youth mechanisms and constituencies in the UN system that address a lot of these MEAs through a universal um, structure or process, um, whether that is 
Oh, sorry, Anand. Yes, I should not not put uh, uh, acronyms so much. MEAs stand for multilateral environment agreements. They basically refer to agreements that are made by countries, or another word from them can be treaties. So that countries come together, they negotiate a treaty, and then it's um, implemented. Uh, we do have mechanisms in several of these processes. Um, some of these uh, processes uh, have been there since 2010 from the previous decade. Some of them are fairly new, uh, which have been operationalized in the last two to three years um, and are still growing. Um, another thing as we discuss this that I want to highlight is the importance of universality in youth engagement. What does universality mean? Um, universality or the term universality, I think I had a slide on it that just said universality, but um, I can talk about it, is essentially means that all young people and especially youth organizations, irrespective of their size, scope, whether they are grassroots organization or whether they are organization with a multi-million budget per year, have same or equitable rights to be engaged with the UN. It is not up to the UN or it's not up to member states to say that a particular organization or group happens to be more important than another. And this is something that is at core of the work of Major Group for Children and Youth, where we believe that each entity, youth entity as we call them, have equitable rights to be engaged and have their voices heard in the decision making, much like the countries itself, just because a country has a delegation of 300 people at COP and somebody, a country that has a delegation of five people at COP does not mean that a bigger delegation gets more say in a consensus or a universal um, process. So this was one thing I wanted to point out. The next thing I want to quickly touch upon before we look at 2023 and 2024 is what we call as principles and barriers of meaningful youth engagement. Um, so let's first look at some, what are some of the key principles of meaningful youth engagement. If you look at the principles, the first, and I mean, you can read the list, uh, the youth engagement should be self-organized, which means young people should have right to determine how they engage, how they work. It should be legally mandated and rights-based, um, which essentially refers to that young people should have a clear mandate. So for example, CEC has a clear mandate to work in IUC and it's not an ad hoc you know, structure that um, is, is created. Similarly, it should be designated, which means that it should not compete with other structures um, that, are, that are there. Um, so it's young people should not have to compete with uh, indigenous peoples or women, or in worst case, even business and industry to have a voice at the table for themselves. And of course, goes without saying, um, well-resourced, which refers to, of course, having enough funds available. Um, the final one, of course, is accountable both internally and externally towards the youth members. Um, looking at what are some of the barriers, uh, they can be summed up very quickly. Uh, we, of course, know about lack of resources. Um, one thing that I want to touch upon is regressive normative framings, which means that young people increasingly are being seen as tokens, are being seen as a crowd, are being seen as oh, we have been able to mobilize a thousand people to come to our event or a hundred people to come to our webinar and that's youth engagement. But we have to understand that young people are more than that. Young people are more than just being uh, tokens of crowd. They are human beings first and foremost and they have their own stories that need to be heard. So we have to make sure that there's no regressive framing that is being run on young people in the UN system, which often happens to, to be done. And of course, changing landscape for non-state actors. Many um, in, in a you know collective space, not everybody likes civil society to be there and therefore youth suffer by default. Moving on, this year, and Diana mentioned this in her intro, and I'll be fast, is that we had uh, Stockholm Plus 50 that took place in Sweden. And it's one of the first outcomes in the UN system that clearly recognized, and you can read uh, in paragraph number nine, intergenerational responsibility as a cornerstone of sound policymaking. Um, specifically, if you look at this uh, part, which says um, building capacity in, of young people to engage with financial institutions and ensuring that there is ease of access of funds for environmental action for youth-led organizations. So this is something that we saw come out for the first time at the Stockholm uh, Plus 50. And indeed, there was a huge mobilization that happened in the lead up to it. Several of you have been part of the working group that worked on those topics. So I think building on this, if we are looking at 2023, and I don't want to give a lecture on you know UN conferences, but I just want to highlight that we are, the reason for highlighting this is that we are looking at 
quite a number of um, important key moments that are coming up in 2023 and 2024. Um, we are looking at uh, the LDC conference and the water conference in March, which would be key to reviewing progress on SDG 6. Um, we are looking at a big work on disaster, uh, disaster risk reduction in May. And of course, uh, in July, I mean, I'm not reading the entire of it. We are looking at the high level political forum. Similarly, um, we are uh, having uh, in September uh, the high level for political forum, the HPF, which reviews the agenda progress on 2030 agenda. It is being convened at the level of heads of the state, and it is called as the SDG summit. So SDG summit essentially is HLPF, which is convened under the purview of the UN General Assembly. And this is going to be really central towards how um, the 2030 agenda is advanced because 2023 is the midpoint of the 2030 agenda between 2015 to 2030 and same as the global stock take on climate change. And then uh, this is, is my, I think my last slide, uh, we are building towards 2024, which is called as the UN Summit of the Future. It's a very newly mandated summit. The co-facilitators for this were just appointed two weeks ago. Um, and it is going to look at that the fact that multilateralism is a threat and what is the UN upgrade going to look like. Some of the topics you're seeing here, but just important to highlight that these are not all the topics. We will see much more come into this. These are only some that, you know, were in a particular PPD slash, uh, you know, uh, dimension that was uh, there, but I just wanted to, you know, point, point that out. In summary, um, uh, yes, and and uh, I see James uh, writing in the uh, chat about the uh, legislation, and I think in Wales, there's also future generations commissioner that is there, and that idea is also being floated in the UN about having a commissioner for future generations and how, you know, that will interface and in the form of the trusteeship council and everything. What I want to mention towards as I conclude towards the end is that of course all of the work that we are doing um, on policy advocacy and Nisha touched upon this is essential but COP28 set the narrative of together for implementation so we really have to make sure that young people are uh, of course able to meaningfully contribute to these processes but they are also involved in implementation of those efforts we are seeing some of that happen in the restoration decade uh, we are seeing some of that happen on country level or regional level. If you look at the green jobs program of the Great uh, Green Wall of Sahel and other spaces, but this needs to, to ramp up. And uh, I'll conclude with one phrase that we have been saying for uh, this year uh, is that if it's not meaningful, it is not youth engagement. And with this, I'll thank Diana and, and the CEC uh, group for having me here and I look forward to engaging further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yagratna. I personally learn a lot every time from you, from your experience, and from this very broad perspective on to really global engagement of young people into climate movement and uh, meaningful work. This very just perspective that you always bring um, excites me and gets me admire your work very much. I am. Um, excited to hear from the audience as well, the questions that uh, might be there. And thus, I forward the word to my colleague, Marie-Philippe, to moderate the further sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. So thank you, everyone. It's really exciting to see your comments and questions in the chat. Um, so we are now entering in the Q&A portion of the session. So you can raise your hand and uh, I will, when your name is called, you can unmute yourself, uh, open your camera if you're comfortable and ask your question. Please make sure you uh, mention um, the question is for which speaker and if it's for multiple speaker, that's great as well. Um, if you're not comfortable asking a question uh, and uh, unmuting yourself, you can use uh, the chat box for sure. So um, I will make sure that all the speakers are ready and back, back with us. Um, do we have a first question for, from the audience?
No question for now. I I know there's question for sure. People might be shy, but I think Diana, you have a question to start off. I do have a question, Marie Philippe. Thank you very much. I was uh, 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 hoping to to uh, not take too much time, but now that I have the possibility, I would love to hear from Kaluki, Nishad, Yagratna, the three very experienced leaders in youth climate movement to share their thoughts, in fact, on saying that maybe gets me most excited these days in the work of youth in climate uh, protection, uh, um, climate change prevention, and that is the role of minors how those who are referred to as children are engaged in the process, what is their role, and most importantly, you, the three of you, being experienced leaders, how do you see the succession within your organizations in general? I think it's incredible to watch the work of young people at a very young age, and I'd be happiest to hear your thoughts. Nishad, Kaluki, Yugratna, whoever is willing to jump in, please, you're very welcome. I can start, and that's a very good question. Um, and I, I just draw my um, statement from, again, the case for Kenya Environmental Action Network, Keen in short. And um, a specific program that we run here in Kenya is called um, the Keen Bustani Gardens. And Bustani is actually Swahili for garden. So how do we um, engage every member of the society in a very practical and experiential learning mechanism that allows them to connect to nature, to soil, and to the world around them. So we've been able to implement this uh, project across different areas in Kenya. And the idea is if you can actually practically work with kids, learners, youth, farmers, and community at the point where they understand most. And most of times you realize this point is uh, usually you know, where their food is being produced, where their water is getting is, is coming from, where the source of firewood and uh, other components of the, the environment are, are coming from, then you actually get to lure them and to get them as serious custodians of nature. So for me, I think it's, it's pretty much important to uh, work across an intergenerational inter approach to um, conservation and protection of nature, recognizing that every different group requires its own, uh, it has its own needs and so it, it requires its own approaches. And one of the ways we've been able to do that Kin is developing a curriculum actually to train kids um, and learners and also farmers. And most of them are, are grassroots and in the rural areas at the point where they understand most. And for me, I think the base is show them how to interact as, uh, with their soils, how to plant and grow foods organically and how this translates into the, the healthy food they're going to have on the table. And, and in, in the long run, how this all connects the sustainable environment everyone is talking about. And from that point, you actually ensure that you're working with every bit of the generations and then no one is left behind. So if anything, I think um, this is one of the ways we can maybe approach conservation and climate action across our different spaces. But I allow uh, Kulat and other colleagues to also give their uh, opinions on this. Nishad and Yugratna, do you want to add to that question? Sure, I can I can come in very briefly, Mary Philip. Um, I think you know one of the one of my uh, favorite quotes, which has also been my status on WhatsApp since twenty eighteen, is that the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit, um, which essentially refers to um, that when we are engaging young people, especially uh, children, adolescents, and and youth demographic, um, it's important to create spaces and then know uh, when exactly um, those spaces uh, should be self-sufficient. Uh, One of my uh, colleague that works in organizing often says that your role is or your key task is to organize yourself out of that particular space. So can it sustain, you know, can the younger generation, can uh, the upcoming uh, young people 
uh, youth networks and, and successors actually sustain that movement and bring more um, vigor to it. Um, one thing that my organization Plan for the Planet does, and speaking more from a, a PFTP hat, is that we have academies for children. Uh, we have done uh, close to uh, 2000 one day workshops, which we call academies for school children between eight to 15. Um, and we have trained more than 90,000 children peer to peer as what we call as climate justice ambassador and uh, um, training them. It's a one day training that, that they attend uh, about what is climate change and more importantly, how they can make impact. Uh, and of course, the content of those trainings has evolved very much from 2010 until 2020, 2022. Um, and we look forward to you know, carrying um, those, those forward. Over to Nishat, perhaps. Well, I mean, I'll just start from where you're going to address, like um, uh, building more uh, very grassroots, strong youth networks is very important, especially from the global south point of view. Uh, many struggle in terms of resources, like uh, Gretna highlighted. Um, it is not just resources and funding, but also capacities to, you know, be at those discussions. And uh, to keep those organizations live, you necessarily require, require those resources. And uh, at the moment, most of them, the youth, as far as my knowledge, within the region in the Middle East, uh, leave this arena or space because it doesn't bring sort of a bread on the table, and it's, it's, it's you need to have a you need to you know look after a family. You should have a, a sort of a revenue generation out of these uh, organizations, but they really don't work that way, uh, especially within the civil society groups in the region. So, like I mentioned, how to make civil society organizations more engaging, their role has to be really defined, how governments can work with them, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if they don't survive and if you don't have the right youth running or right civil society organization within any community or country, uh, people will find more avenues and you may lose a lot of creative young people um, not being part of such organization and uh, look for um, uh, corporate interest area. They will, they will find elsewhere else where they can find money. So I think uh, building a grassroots organization with uh, great roots and great uh, financial and capacity building could be a game changer, at least for the MENA region in the coming years, um, because there's no large organization of that uh, volume working here, which can actually accommodate or employ young people at the moment. It's more, more or less voluntary basis and uh, fundings are basically project to project and uh, you have to remove those uh, extra resources after uh, the project because you don't have enough resources to keep them in. So that's something should actually define in the coming days if uh, you really want to attract young people to be more on the youth and civil society sector. And uh, that can only be done if really, really uh, there is a great support from both uh, private and public sector uh, and also from the agencies, you know, giving them that wide platform for them. Uh, same goes to Africa, I guess, and Asia and Africa do share the similar demography and struggle like the Middle East. So I think we are all on the same 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 side of the you know issues, uh, and it, it can be a collective call for having a, a huge um, global South movement. You know, where, where you support one another. Amazing. Thanks, Nishad. And we have, I think you can stay on because we have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, perhaps, Justin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question or I can, I can go and read it? Okay, I will go. So for you, Nishad, what, um, what have you found to be the biggest hurdle for youth and young professional engagement in your work regionally, nationally, and internationally? That's a, a big question. Well, I mean, I, I would give a broader answer to that. Still, young people are not seen as a solution. Like Yogurt mentioned, it's more on youth tokenization. Yeah, we have a youth delegate in our, uh, our national team to COPS or uh, Stockholm Summit, but they are not really a youth who are from the youth organization. They are just some of the employee of their government, uh, which uh, only talk governmental uh, policies, not uh, anything that is critical of the government, or at least the policy you really want to change. So I think um, the biggest issue is still uh, not having the right young people uh, who are joining with right capacity, supporting uh, uh, national policy or calling for change at least. Uh, so 
in a bit that I hope uh, the the whole youth washing uh, should be taken off within the UN agencies too. I mean, they are also quite impressive in youth washing and to some extent, I believe some of the sessions you attend of the UN also has like, hey, you bring this hippie activist on the stage and you know they're happy to see them on the stage too. So it comes from all the spheres. I wouldn't just blame the uh, our government's doing that, but UN also is somehow blamable for all this, um, you know, sort of uh, dramatic scenes at uh, summits, etc. So another second one would be more on resources and funding. Uh, uh, that is the biggest, biggest challenge. Like I said, we are not able to keep the young people in our sector. They keep moving because they don't find this place is going to help them to find a basic day-to-day -day needs of them. So that's something very important, yeah. So I think more the youth washing and uh, resource and funding are two issues I would see uh, very critical in our part of the region. Thank you, that's really interesting. So Kaluki or Yukratna, do you have uh, something to add for that question? And I can repeat it if needed. I think Nisha actually tackled it very well, but I also said there's that bit of um, lack of meaningful representation or engagement. At times we've seen even in our countries, uh, youth being represented by non-youth and, 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 and the non-youth folks claiming to actually do the work for youth and, and put in line um, policies or arrangements that can help youth to navigate. And I think that's a bit unfair because you cannot negotiate, plan for, or argue a case for people that don't have a say or don't have a, a, a seat at the table to actually air out their views. So I think there needs that open and honest discussion and actually allowing youth to just be and, and give them the space without tokenism to actually express themselves, but express ourselves because we're not in that category and therefore help to tweak our solutions together. And we're not saying we don't want an intergenerational approach, but the truth is youth also have to be centered in these discussions and we do have to have that meaningful uh, representation um, in these um, such spaces. Thank you, Yigretna. Thank you, uh, Diana. I think um, one thing that I mentioned in my presentation about on the slides about the barriers. Uh, it, uh, I mean, I highlighted, I think, four key barriers. One of them was, um, I think, uh, lack of resources, obviously, which has been highlighted already. The second, and this is coming more from a policy space, right, but also somewhat implementation, is that young people are increasingly seen as tokens, uh, what is also called youth washing, and not realizing uh, young people as their own uh, you know, rights holders of a process. Uh, then the third, I think, barrier that I highlighted was that there is a shrinking space for civil society in the uh, both policy and implementation uh, spaces where, whether that's government or private sector or in general, those that may be driving implementation, they do not want to have civil society engaged meaningfully. Everybody likes, you know, um, when the groups at COP do actions and it looks all, all great and, and nice. But the question then is that, are you actually taking their voices into the negotiating process? Um, are you expanding spaces for them systemically? Um, so I think those would be some, you know, key points that I would to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Yugratna. And that's really interesting to have your, your vision or uh, on that question. And I think you can stay on for the next question that will be for all uh, speakers as well. So we have a question in the chat from Salima. The question, it, the question is, what are you hoping we can achieve or see change for more meaningful youth engagement and leadership in international work. You Gretna, is that too much for you to jump in oh, again? No, no. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I was just uh, walking yeah. to another room, please. Sure. Thank you so much. No, oh. sure, pleasure. So um, what are you hoping we can achieve or see change for more meaningful youth 
young professional engagement and leadership yeah. in international work. Thank you, Mary Philippe. I think um, one of the, so, I mean, this is a very, you know, uh, complicated questions, obviously, to, to answer, but I think what we really need to do is, and I'm speaking at some of our consultations for Stockholm Plus 50 and other spaces gave those results, uh, mm -hmm. which is that um, first we need engagement of the grassroots youth, young people that are actually on the front lines of these problems. They deserve to be heard directly. Often there is an approach that big organizations or groups, um, so they claim to represent grassroots, but grassroots young people, indigenous youth, youth from uh, poor uh, families, they do not have to be channeled through uh, big NGOs in order to have their voices heard. And same for young professionals. Um, so they need direct representation at the table. Um, and the spaces for that, those have to be created and where they already exist have to be, have to be maintained. Uh, the second part, you know, would go down to what I was mentioning in my slide about legally mandated, which means that um, whenever young people engage in an in, in, in international policy process, uh, engaging one-off or engaging just because of the goodwill of the UN or goodwill of a particular country that may be hosting or presiding over that process is not enough. We need mm -hmm. clear mandates, which means that the official outcomes of negotiations, and it has happened for many groups, they need to recognize and mandate those groups to be engaged long-term. So young people cannot be taken out. So the engagement is not discretionary. Um, in nature, especially in international processes. So you cannot say that, oh, this year we're going to engage you, but next year we're going to engage, uh, not engage you or engage you in it this way or that way. So we need rules in a multilateral system that should be mandated. And I think those would be two key pointers. Thank you. Thank you. Kaluki, do you want to answer that question? I will be interested to see, to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, um, of course, on top of what my friend Grant has added, I think the bit of also financial constraints, uh, we do need to redefine um, and, and change how financing is working, like actually for youth-led initiatives and indigenous grassroots and, and on the ground um, in uh, projects. You know, you know, we need to move from the conventional way of funding to actually a more bottoms up um, financing of projects on the ground that can actually help sustain the change that we want. Because right now, I think someone just put in the chat box about how hard it is to even access funding from a youth perspective and that most of the youth cannot package the ideas because the only way of engagement is through volunteerism. And remember these people have their, their backgrounds, they have families to feed, they have friends to pay, they have every other bill to pay. But how do you pay this bill? in a world that is already like uh, automatically put you in a place where you cannot earn nothing. So I do think we need to like uh, reduce restrictions when it comes to youth uh, funding for projects. And we need to see youth for the new uh, potential that they, they, they allow us to get into in, in conservation with technology and time, like I mentioned, this is what youth can bring to the table. And we need to quantify that time. If a youth is spending time uh, training somewhere, can we quantify that with funds that can support them to sustain their, 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 their livelihoods. And then that actually helps us to get to the change that you want to see and to build the next frontiers of livelihoods for the 21st centuries and for the world's uh, youth population, which is by far now the youngest and, and the most, um, um, the, the highest demographic that we have. So I think if we can also check on those, it will really help us push us towards the change that we need to see. And the final one is um, the bit of, um, knowledge knowledge is a key asset that we do need to encompass across all this and recognizing that youth also bear knowledge in all its forms so don't just see youth as a people like you mentioned that just have to be invited uh, to take the box and then after that there's no meaning um, meaningful engagement how do we translate the knowledge that youth bring into into a um, sort of like a ipr where young people can also earn or develop their expertise in the field and therefore becoming experts and then getting more access to livelihoods, jobs, and other opportunities to support the family, support nature, and support um, the, the restoration movement. Um, I think that is as much as I can say for now. Thank you so much. Thank you for that addition. Yeah, that's so true. And yeah, thank you for that. And Nisha, do you have 
uh, anything to add to those answers? Well, um, I don't have much to add on that. Um, basically, I would uh, see one more point mostly on the inclusivity, how the, how the global youth and the movement can be more inclusive. That would be something uh, I would add to add to those great points made by Yuvaratna and uh, Kalonki. Yeah, sure. And I think uh, we will now go over our last question, with, which will bring us uh, to think about the future and what you, uh, you think of your role in that future. So we have a question from Tommy. And the question is, where do you see yourself in our world environment in the next 10 year and what role do you see yourself playing in it it's a tricky one it's hard to think about the future but uh Nishad, if you have um <clears throat> something some thought ready for that um you can go sorry well i i feel the conversation around environment and climate is going to move forward seeing what happened at uh uh, at Sharma Sheikh, we celebrated um, a loss and damage, but 1.5 was far away from the reality. So the the the, the sang shows that we are already 2.5. So we are nowhere getting to where we are required. And like Yogaratna mentioned, we cannot just meet uh, the, the the global triple threat uh, by just UN Climate Summit, but it has to have more biodiversity and it has to be a cross-sectional uh, parallel uh, issues to be solved, not just one at a time. And we are already crossing the limit and the time and duration we require. I think it's time for more and more uh, youth-based uh, initiatives to work ahead, coming up with real, real on in the world solutions, not lab scale anymore, looking at uh, more science-based solutions uh, with real targets, et cetera. And I believe the conversation around um, uh, environment and climate will be more on the youth and how youth-led solution can be really a chain maker unlike what we have at the moment. Uh, so I think that would be a real chain maker from, uh, I mean, I always see, see this way from activists on the street to the labs and the decision-making rooms. So that would be the future I look into. Thank you, Nishad. Kaluki. Thank you. I always call myself a stubborn optimist and I'm never apologetic about that. So in 10 years, I, I think I, I see myself as a catalyst will be helping first and foremost. I don't think I'll still be youth in 10 years, but I want to be a youth ally and someone like someone who is um, at the center of helping to negotiate for youth movements and really unlocking the potential and the resources for them to access funding and, and support that they need to scale up and, and start initiatives um, on the grassroots. And I think this is the key opportunity that we have if we are to ever reverse and uh, biodiversity loss and halt our you know, climate changing climate um, system. For me, I see myself playing that critical role of actually causing the good chaos and helping organizations look the, the way of youth and grassroots and actually see the potential in uh, financing, for instance, nature-based solutions, youth-led and grassroots uh, restoration programs, and at the same time, helping to tell our stories. Because I believe uh, in the saying that tell our people a story in a particular uh, way and they believe it. And it's our responsibility to actually retell a new story, a story of hope, a story of resilience, and a story of the beautiful world that we can have, but only if we act with care, we act with love, and we let kindness lead us while we, we restore and protect our world's natural spaces uh, for posterity and for generations to come. Now, that would be my ideal world in 10 years from now. I love it. Thank you. And you, Gratna? Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I think um, when it comes to my own personal um, perspective, I'm still a young, young woman working. I'm still figuring out what I want uh, from my own life and where I want to um, you know, proceed ahead. Um, and there are a lot of options, obviously. Um, but when it comes to the broader environmental landscape, I think in the next five years and 10 years, we have to make substantive uh, substantial progress on 
the 2030 agenda and all of its targets of SDGs and the Paris Agreement and all of the multilateral environment agreements that have been adopted and we need our, to do our best to meet their targets. It's possible and um, that's why those targets have been set. And you know they say it's insanity if you keep doing the same thing again and again uh, with the same outcome. So if the UN system exists, if negotiations exist, if policymaking exists, they really have to deliver. Nelson Mandela said that it is impossible. It's everything is impossible until it's done. So we really have to do that. And I see yeah, young people as uh, bringing that positive energy. And I see young people as advocates um, that are doing, and that's why I work in, in this field because youth do not have another agenda. We are not caring about our shareholders or our stock prices mm -hmm. or election cycles, you know, to be reelected again. Young people are doing this because they want a better future for themselves and for the future generations that are not even born. So you cannot take away that moral high ground that the youth constituency or youth movements have. And I think that really is a key towards uh, success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yugratna. Thank you, Nishad and Kaluki. Indeed, reflecting on the selflessness of children and youth, how much of dedication and great energy, a lot of unpaid hours of volunteering, but a passionate work that young people do across the world in contribution to environment protection. I am amazed every time talking to young people, learning about the scope of activities of their organizations, what the three of you have shared with us today and the concept that we had for the dialogue from local to global, having this perspective of three personal stories, you sharing with us uh, the work that you do on a local, international, global level, us having a better perspective on to what so many international, local, um, community-centered youth organizations do. There are so many young people passionate about the idea of saving the world and the natural environment that is there to preserve by future generations. Us young people having this momentum today, but also understanding that there were previous generations who were there doing a, an impressive work, in fact, in um, nature conservation and creating the youth movement at their time for us to have the conditions today to be in the roles that we are with possibilities that we have, but also having a perspective onto what are the future generations receiving in terms of the conditions for youth work and engagement that should be better, more immersive, more meaningful than what we have today. And this really um, perspective onto the engagement of minors and so many more points that we still have to work on. I am excited to hear these insights today and I would like to pass on the word to Camilla. Thank you. I will just squeeze in and go before Camilla goes. So I just want to thank everyone for your question, for your insight in the chat, for sharing your thoughts and sharing your experience. It's not the end. Let's keep it's not the end, let's keep the, the momentum going. We will gather all the questions from the chat and make sure to follow up on those, but you can also always contact us. Um, just looking ahead, we will have a presence at the next COP15 as CEC in Montreal and uh, at IMPACT5 in Vancouver next February. So this will be great opportunity for us to work together and to network make sure you share your plan um, for the upcoming months in the group, rather it's regional, national, international plan. Um, and also uh, if you enjoy today's session, make sure you join us as CEC member. So over to Camilla now. Thank you, Marie-Philippe. And we're not done yet. We still have a very special part of our session. I want to quickly thank the speakers for dedicating the time to this. We know how busy you are, we know how tirelessly you work, and we're very grateful that you engage with the wider IUCN family um, as we continue to work towards more meaningful youth engagement. I now have the pleasure of introducing our special guest who will offer some closing remarks. It is an honor for us to introduce to you 
Dr. Margaret Otieno, or Meg, as we know her. Meg is the deputy chair of the IUCN Commission on Education and Communication and a passionate environmental educator. Meg holds a PhD in climate change and education for sustainable development and an MSc in environment and development. She has over 20 years um, of experience in the environmental education field and is currently the CEO of the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. She herself had a connection to nature from a young age that has influenced her trajectory and career. And Meg, we are very happy to offer you the floor and to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Camilla. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening depending on which part of this globe you are in. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and a very special commendation to the Nature for All team for organizing uh, and hosting such an amazing and informative session. I have really enjoyed uh, listening to the young people and uh, I feel very strongly that our future is secure. If these are the young people that are going to take over from us, and I think I'd better just sit back, relax, because I know that we are safe. Dear friends, uh, our biodiversity, uh, the environment, uh, lay the foundation of the economy and the well-being of society. Uh, I think it's uh, Kaluki who mentioned this, that 85% of the world's 1.2 billion uh, young people live in regions that are directly dependent on land and natural resources for sustenance. And uh, in this, I'm talking about Africa, I'm talking about Central America, uh, most parts of Asia and all. Uh, the youth are therefore a key constituency in conservation. And there is no way we can talk about conservation if we do not talk about the youth. So engaging the youth will not only create a direct impact on changing youth behavior and attitudes, but they can also influence their families and friends, both locally and internationally. Um, sometime in July, when we were in uh, at the African Parks Congress, I listened to the youth and I realized that their minds are not closed to the local environment, but they are thinking globally and that is really amazing. So dear participants, you have a unique capacity to shape a sustainable future. But I have to remind you that youth is a transitional and crucial phase in human development and um, the opportune time for you to develop the skills needed to take action for nature in your chosen profession. This is therefore uh, an important time for you, not only to learn, um, but also to participate in the restoration processes in addition to influencing policies, touching on biodiversity and the environment. And by the way, I don't know if you're aware about this, but I think you are because somebody talked about the various uh, Multi, uh, multilateral agreements and constituency that acknowledge the importance of youth, of involving and engaging youth in conservation. Uh, what I wanted to say is that youth participation is actually a fundamental right and it's acknowledged by various international organizations. And I think we, we got uh, an overview of this and that was very impressive, uh, just to mention, to Ocean's Youth Constituency and UNCCD, uh, Youth Caucus. So it's actually a human right. So it's very, very important. Uh, Africa has the youngest population in the world with 70% of Sub-Saharan Africa under the age of 30. Such a high number of young people is an opportunity for the continent's growth, but only if they are fully empowered to realize their best potential. The youth shouldn't wait to be given this opportunity. They should demand, they should take over. So uh, you don't have anybody to blame. You should demand and you should take over. You know, somebody said something 
here, I think it was in the charts, that after igniting the youth, uh, when one stops being in that age group, uh, also give them options uh, on how to continue being engaged, but as adults. And in introducing me, Camilla mentioned that uh, I was engaged in nature very, very early as a child. And that is what actually guided my career choice. And uh, the fact that you're youth now and you're moving out of that phase does not mean that you stop engaging. The options are there. Having been a child conservationist and then a youth conservationist, in fact, I was such a strong uh, um, advocate. I used to lobby and you know, just mobilizing uh, university students when I was in the university and even when I just started working. Up to the time I was about 30 years uh, before now, I started empowering the generation after myself to take over. So you have that responsibility. The fact that you're moving out of the stage of being a youth does not mean that you disconnect. There are many opportunities. There are children for you to engage with nature. There are uh, other young people for you to engage with nature. And there are a special groups like marginalized groups and even women who are very, very key and whose uh, engagement in conservation is very important and we, we have to engage them. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you are all very energetic. You are tech savvy. You do things with the with the computers that I, I I just think you're a magician, you know, and uh, you tend to be more objective. You're not like us because once uh, people hit forty, they start being very uh, stubborn about changing their views about things. They think that that is how things are supposed to be. It's very difficult to change the mind of a forty, fifty year old person. In fact. Uh, I remember just a few days, I was trying to buy, uh, I was looking for a, a specific, specific perfume. And uh, this lady who was selling the perfume insisted that this is really nice, this is trendy. And I found it extremely difficult, trendy, nice. No, I don't want that. I just want to take what I'm used to. So that is exactly how it is in changing the mindset of a 40 year old or, a, or of a 50 year old to start doing things differently, but you are different. You can do a lot to revive our damaged ecosystem. You are innovators. Come up with innovative, forward-looking, forward-thinking solutions to address the complex biodiversity and environmental challenges. I urge you to come up with solutions to, to uh, challenges such as human wildlife conflict, which is currently a big thing, especially with climate change. Uh, things like climate change and many others. You can engage in so many things. Uh, during the dialogue, uh, listen to the various things that you are all doing. But just to mention a few, there are things that you can engage in that are very easy. Afforestation, water conservation, use of uh, reusable resources, research, Innovate, lobby, engage in advocacy, influence policy, both locally and internationally. Uh, as a Nature for All movement, we would like the youth to value the role of biodiversity and we encourage the young people to take leadership and ownership of the challenges they face through conservation, conservation solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I was watching the uh, going on at um, in Egypt and what is happening in Panama, I'm imagining that the young people on this platform and elsewhere must be thinking about the solutions they can come up with. Don't expect the solutions to come from us. I've mentioned to you what happens once people hit 40 and 50. We, 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 we can't really think outside the box. So it's upon you and you have that burden and we want to see solutions from you. Let's create a global community of youth working for conservation.
conservation. Together, we can move the youth and conservation agenda forward. It's a burden I'm leaving to you, but we are here to guide you and even to help you to look for finances whenever it's necessary. I thank you so much for this. I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you for all the uh, discussions that have taken place. And as I said, I sit back comfortably knowing that our mother earth is actually safe. It's in safe hands. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Meg, for your message. We know that you're an ally to us and we thank you for your leadership. Um, thanks everyone for joining. We will drop a survey in the chat so you can tell us what you thought about this dialogue. We hope to host more and we want them to be useful to you. So please take a moment to fill out the survey and all of you registered will receive um, a link to the recording in a few days. Thank you for your time and your commitment and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody, for all that you do. Thank you very much. Very inspiring.